Welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2022. Uh, today is February 2nd, 2022. And this is the second session in the first track of the Ontology Summit. Um, and today um, should be a very interesting meeting uh, with Doug Lennon. And so I'll pass it over now to Ravi, who will be chairing this session. Ravi, go ahead. Uh, one minute. Um, we hope everyone has joined or they will be joining as we go along. It gives me a great pleasure, especially today, to welcome a stalwart, a person who has spent decades several decades worrying about how ontological thought can be captured and expressed as IT solutions. We have, we have today Doug Lennett, Dr. Doug Lennett, who has tremendous amount of academic background and now practical background of running a company for several years. Uh, he's going to talk to you about, uh, all of us, about PsyCorp architecture applications. He will provide deep insights into how Psych uh, solutions workspace uh, or applications can uh, address intelligence, reasoning, ontology, knowledge bases, and natural languages. Doug Lennett was awarded the Biennial Computers and Thought Award in 1977 for his pioneering work in symbolic machine learning and automated discovery. Dr. Lennett was professor at CMU another great computer related learning place and Stanford, both are at the top even today and left academia to found the Psych project in 1984, which is still proceeding at full speed in the form of PsyCorp. It's 50 plus people company and he is the CEO. He is the only individual to have served on scientific advisory boards of both Microsoft and Apple. And we know a lot of people <clears throat> who have worked at Psych have also made their mark elsewhere in the world after they have learned and contributed to growth of Psych. So I, it is a great pleasure that I welcome and request Dr. Lennart to start his address today. I hope there will be some version of slides that we can post. Otherwise, part most of this session would be recorded. And uh, it is, again, a great pleasure. Thanks, Ken, and other members of our, our ontology team. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Doug Lennon. Thank, thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Ken, for inviting me. Um, I wanted to share with you a sort of a 20, 25 year updated version of a talk I gave at the very first meeting of the Ontolog Forum uh, about the lessons that we learned <laughs> along the way of building Psych. You could think of this as uh, the hard won lessons we learned by making mistakes. And a lot of what I'll talk to you about are the mistakes we made and hopefully uh, some of them will resonate with you and some of them may avoid you making the same the same mistakes so since many of you are academics i feel like i should organize this by talking about the mistakes that we made not just building psych but in the pre-psych era and i should talk to you about the plans i have for mistakes i intend to make in the next few years going forward. And so I'll talk a little bit about that at the very end. Uh, so in terms of the pre-psych 
era, uh, there was uh, a set of experiments and projects that I did um, partly as a graduate student at Stanford in the early 1970s, working with Cordell Green on automatic program synthesis, getting programs to write other programs. We did things involving uh, specifying what program you wanted by giving a set of input output pairs. Uh, that turned out to be too simple in some ways. We picked a harder task like synthesizing Patrick Winston's arch learning PhD thesis, which had just been written recently. Uh, and even though that was several pages of Lisp code, we were, and we were trying to do that via natural language dialogue, we succeeded. But part of the reason we succeeded was that we had this fixed target and we could analyze the heck out of it. And so what I learned from that was having a fixed target, even a big one, makes the problem too easy. There are ways to cut corners, in many cases, unconscious ways to cut corners, and you don't really learn as much as you should if you have that narrow uh, fixed target. Uh, there were similar lessons being learned by the robotics folks who were solving problems by doing things like, oh, we'll put everything on a big piece of graph paper, or we'll make these bricks really shiny, or, well, the, the, the bolt was um, uh, not quite going into the nut, so we'll file the bolt to a point and so on. So if you have too narrow a task, you don't learn as much as you should. The same kind of lesson, the analog lesson was being learned in natural language, in expert systems, and in many areas in AI at the same time. So my reaction was to build a program called AM, Automated Mathematician. It wasn't a theorem prover, it was a theorem proposer. So it was, its only goal was to find interesting things by using a few hundred heuristics for what you ought to do to try to discover things, what you ought to do to notice things being interesting and so on. So for instance, one of its hundreds of heuristics was if you have some function f, look at the inverse of extreme or near extreme members of the range of that. So if you have a function f like divisors, so the divisors of 12 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12, um, look at the inverse of extrema of sets of numbers. Well, what are some extreme kinds of sets of numbers? There'd be things like the empty set or singletons or doubletons. So divisors inverse of singletons, well, is sort of like, um, nothing really interesting, just the number one. Um, of doubletons, it's this set here, which if you didn't already know about prime numbers, wouldn't be particularly interesting. Of tripletons, it's this set here. And hey, they all seem to be perfect squares. So one of the heuristics was don't pass up a bargain. Let's actually look at their square roots. And hey, their square roots are that set we just said wasn't interesting. So now we have an interesting thing that we learned about the set that we call prime numbers. And in this way, AM discovered hundreds of interesting things. Um, for instance, even in this one case, it looked at the inverse of numbers with abnormally many divisors and discovered things about highly composite numbers. Uh, one of the members of my PhD committee was George Polya. And at one point he said, oh, you know, this reminds me of something that a student of a friend of mine once worked on. And he dug through a chest in his attic and pulled out some notebook. And his friend was Hardy and the student was Ramanujan. And one of the things that Ramanujan had done was more or less exactly what AM had gone through. So I felt, I felt really good about that. Uh, so that was awesome. That was fun. Um, the interestingness heuristics never evolved, which meant that as it got farther and farther away from set theory, uh, the rate at which it discovered things went down and down and down. So the next set of experiments were trying to get a system like that called Eurisco that could actually learn new heuristics, modify and learn and evaluate and test new heuristics. And that was awesome and fun and led to a lot of interesting discoveries and uh, tournament championships in wargaming, all sorts of things. Uh, but again, it seemed to eventually slow down and break down because we didn't have a good world model. It wasn't built on a general model of world knowledge, of common sense, of what people know, um, and so on. And what people do when they 
are confronted with some novel situation is they either fall back on more and more and more general knowledge. Like for example, if my computer stops working at some point, I'll unplug it and plug it back in because I have that very general piece of knowledge um, or they analogize to superficially far flung specific pieces of knowledge and wisdom and rules of thumb. But if you think about it, the systems we were building, the expert systems we were building, the AM and Eurisco systems, the learning systems, the natural language systems, none of those had common sense knowledge to fall back on. None of those had far flung knowledge to analogize to. So it's no wonder that they were brittle. So this essentially culminated in the realization that we had to prime the knowledge pump. We had to somehow build that foundation of fundamental knowledge and commonly known um, broad knowledge to analogize to um, and so on. And so in 1980, um, well, very early 1984, I held my own sort of mini Dartmouth conference at Stanford to try to figure out how much effort would be required to actually capture that body of common sense and common knowledge. And everybody applied their own methods. Language people like Winograd calculated uh, the, um, the number of words in a, um, in a typical natural language and how much people knew about them. Uh, people like uh, Newell and Simon uh, focused more on things like uh, how uh, rapidly do concepts get burned into long-term memory. So by the time someone was five or six years old, how many things could they have possibly learned and retained um, and so on. McCart uh, 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 Marvin Minsky uh, uh, did some back of the envelope uh, calculation. He actually wouldn't start until we found him an actual physical envelope that he could do the calculation on. Um, but um, uh, it involved uh, something that Alan Kay and I were working on involving uh, if we were looking through an op encyclopedia, how many articles were there and how many things would you need to write down to actually capture the content of those encyclopedia articles and so on. The interesting thing was all of these estimates came up with about the same result, which was you'd need like about a million or two rules um, um, in the sense that we were thinking of expert system rules at the time to sort of cover that. Um, and uh, that was sort of daunting because, you know, with a professor with a small number of graduate students, that would take me several centuries to do. And just at that time, the Japanese fifth generation computing effort was starting, something which threatened to do in AI and computing software more generally and hardware, what Japan had just finished doing in the automotive and consumer electronics industries, namely wresting control away from the West. And so Congress passed the NCRA, the National Cooperative Research Act, which said, hey, all you large American tech companies, normally we would prosecute you for antitrust violations if you worked together and colluded, but for the next 10 years, we promised to look the other way. And so research consortia began to spring up in the United States. And the first one was MCC, the Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation here in Austin, Texas. And Admiral Bob Inman, who was running that, came and talked to me and said, look, Professor, if, if you really want to live to see the end of this, you know, move to the wilds of Austin, Texas. We'll have 10 times as many people working on this. You'll just barely live to see the end of it. Uh, and in some sense, he was exactly right. And so now, now that you all have waited about 40 years to, um, to hear this talk, uh, we are at a point where we have a kind of quiescence. We have a kind of adequacy of what's been represented in psych uh, so far. 10 years at MCC and then um, almost 30 years now um, heading up PsychCorp um, as, Ravi, as Ravi mentioned. And I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Let me go back uh, since we have, uh, we have distinguished people like uh, Ron and John and, and Deborah and, and so on in the audience. And I wanna give my view of uh, something that you all should know and you all should be able to articulate to people who don't know the strengths and weaknesses of symbolic reasoning in general um, and various kinds of logic and so on. The, the power of doing this kind of inference uh, is 
transparency compared to say statistical machine learning where you get an answer, uh, but uh, there is uh, only an explanation in quotes in the sense of uh, here's the data which led us to this answer. There's not the same chain of step by step by step logical causal reasoning that you get when you use logic and deduction. Also, no matter how long the chain is, if it really is a deduction, you can trust the results. Whereas uh, because of the six degrees of separation, things are related to other things if you're not careful. Uh, it's very dangerous to, um, to trust long chains using non-logical reasoning. Also, you can, if you want not just get an answer, you can get the top n answers with arguments for and against each one. An example of what I mean by an argument is, this is something Psych did uh, when the Madrid train station was bombed. Everyone jumped to the conclusion that Edda was responsible because, well, pretty much everything bad that happened in Spain uh, involving terrorism for decades was um, the result of this Basque terrorist group on um, Edda. Uh, but Psych was able to give arguments for and against every one of these actors being responsible. And in the case of uh, something like Edda, uh, yes, there were some arguments for it, but there were also arguments against it, like um, Edda hating to have civilian casualties and never shirking taking responsibility after the fact and uh, so on. So because of this, there was a lot of realization that we shouldn't jump to this conclusion, and at least the U.S. and Israeli intelligence agencies um, bucked the common thought in the world, which was that uh, um, Edda was responsible and said, well, maybe it was something else. In fact, it turned out later it was Al-Qaeda that was responsible. Um, um, and also, if you don't have training data, then it's very hard to train your system. So thinking about things that are hypothetical counterfactuals are things that logic can do, uh, but statistics is very bad if you don't have data. On the other hand, the power of statistics is often you do have data. And more sometimes is more, starting with Galton. Uh, and if you really are on a limited budget, then certainly starting at a cost of near zero has some advantages and so on. Uh, so the weaknesses of uh, the right brain or thinking fast or machine learning or statistical type um, AIs, um, you know, this is sort of like uh, I can give you some funny examples like this one, or you know, maybe this is really not so funny. Um, you know, I think I have alcohol poisoning and, you know, it's proudly telling you that it found seven liquor stores uh, close to you and so on. Um, uh, but um, we see the limitation, we see the brittleness all the time. Like if you ask Google, who is the prime minister of the UK when the current prime minister was born, uh, um, it'll give you tens of millions of hits, none of which give you the right answer. Almost all of those tens of millions tell you that Boris Johnson was born on June 19th, 1964. Um, and if you modify your query and say, who is the prime minister of the United Kingdom in June of 1964, you will get tens of millions of hits. Um, interestingly, most of those hits still give you the wrong answer uh, because they almost all talk about Harold Wilson because there's so much more to say about Harold Wilson than there is about the right answer, which was Alex Douglas Home. So machine learning obviously suffers if there's no data or little data or um, there are very rare events or if there are two faults that are occurring, two diseases or two problems with your car at the same time where the symptoms mask and superimpose each other and so on. Or if you're thinking about hypothetical counterfactuals like this sort of what if situation, like what are the ways that we should worry about the Hoover Dam being exploded and um, and uh, destroyed, and eventually you get to things which you could actually look for, like sudden atypical transfers of a certain size um, into, uh, say, Pakistani uh, bank accounts and so on. So um, in addition to, to that, you can think of this not just as the places that right brain thinking suffers, but also as the places where there could be some potential synergy between right and left brain type AIs. And I'll talk about this right near the end of my talk again, because I think this is one of the most important points is that we should be partnering more and synergizing more between our type of symbolic AI and the type of statistical machine learning 
that the other 98% of AI is so focused on. Uh, this is especially true if you have situations where experts disagree, but a round table of experts actually can get things done and so on. So you could be uh, somewhat pejorative and say, well, all of this shows that right brain thinking, thinking fast, doing machine learning, um, just is the veneer of intelligence. It's not um, real um, intelligence. And um, the, um, if you think about the way that the human brain uh, works, at least in this caricature, um, those are the places where left brain reasoning really comes in, the kind of reasoning that say the Sherlock Holmes character does or, um, and so on. Um, but uh, in fact, it's not just right brain AIs that have the veneer of intelligence. Um, the same could really be said about purely left brain AIs too, if you're not careful. So what do I mean by that? Well, a good example um, of that is the expert systems that we built. This is one we built with Alain Bonnet doing skin disease diagnosis. Uh, and it asked questions like, are the spots on the body? What color? Are there more on the trunk? And eventually diagnoses the patient as having measles. Um, and the reason this is a case of brittleness is that this is the patient, my rusted out old white station wagon at the time. And it basically made this mistake because it didn't know that mechanical devices don't generally get human diseases um, and uh, vice versa, that kind of piece of common sense. So more generally, we could say that our kind of artificial intelligence, our kind of symbolic ontological um, and logical AI um, is brittle um, for a lot of reasons. And one of them is that you have stovepiped applications built by different people, built by different companies, built by different groups. And sometimes they end up missing opportunities for one rule to trigger another that was built by somebody else because they happen to use different terms when they actually meant the same concept. And sometimes the opposite, the converse happens, which is they do use the same terms, but they mean slightly different things. And then it would be even worse to try to just combine those by unioning all their rules together. Also, as I mentioned, cost is often a factor the building of knowledge-based systems, ontologically-based systems is orders of magnitude more than the cost of simply grabbing some off-the-shelf machine learning system and setting it to work on some data set. Um, and also speed is often important and the machine learning systems are often much faster, many orders of magnitude, exponentially faster than the cost of building and running the symbolic systems. Um, so, so someone is talking, if they could mute themselves, I would appreciate that. Um, the, uh, the other kind of problem, at least until recently, is um, our systems didn't always deal the right way or sophisticatedly enough with things that had um, exceptions, that had elaboration tolerance, that uh, requirements that were contextualized. And so and I'll have a lot more to say about that. And um, as we already mentioned, if the application required having common sense and general knowledge, in general, whoever was paying for a system to do say um, oil log, oil well log analysis, uh, wasn't gonna pay a um, hundred times that amount to also build a foundation of common sense. They just wanted their application built. So I think that if you step back and think about these two different ways of powering an AI and the strengths and weaknesses and so on that they had, this is not really news and it shouldn't be news to you. It shouldn't be news to other people. And yet it still seems to be news to a lot of people. So it's important to, for us to, to recognize that um, this is something that AI researchers have understood at least on and off for half a century now. Um, if you look back to the early work of McCulloch uh, and Pitts and Hebb, if you look at Minsky and Papert's work on perceptrons and so on, um, other than a few tweaks like convolution, um, the architecture of their systems is pretty much the same. So what were they waiting on for 50 years? Well, they were waiting for computers to get faster. Uh, they were waiting for um, things like graphic processing units that made them even faster for the things they wanted to calculate. Uh, they were waiting for there to be lots of training data um, and for the storage cost of that large amount of data to be small. Um, and so on. And we could say the same thing about the symbolic or ontologically based or knowledge-based types of AI. 
um, going back before computers to the philosophers who worked these systems out for theoretical reasons up to the computer scientists who actually put that theory into practice and built applications like Dendral in uh, the early 1960s. And if you look at the architecture of Dendral, it's not really that much different from the architecture of our knowledge-based systems today. So what were we waiting for? Well, we were waiting for computers to get faster, but we were also waiting for solutions to about 150 nagging problems like context and contradictions and um, the things were just running too slowly. If you used resolution theorem proving, uh, your typical problem wouldn't be solved before the heat death of the universe and things like that. And as I mentioned, we were waiting for someone to pull the mattress off the road so traffic could proceed, waiting for someone to prime the pump with general common sense knowledge and broad knowledge of what the average person knows about the world. Um, so um, I think that, uh, what do you do? yes, so basically priming the pump meant that we had to put together a large ontology, and I'll talk more about the psych ontology we've put together um, going forward, but it's been almost 40 years. We spent about a quarter of a billion dollars. We spent thousands of person years of um, researchers and developers and engineers time. Most of those people have PhDs in philosophy. Uh, some of them are mathematicians. Some of them are computer scientists. Some of them are linguists. And so most of them are PhD philosophers. Um, and we've built a system where we try to keep these numbers here as small as possible. But even though we try to keep policing and making them as small as possible, we're still talking about many tens of thousands of relations, functions, predicates, hundreds of thousands of natural kinds and types, um, millions of terms and tens of millions of uh, axioms that had to get written by hand in order to get to the place that I mentioned where we actually feel we're reaching quiescence. We had to, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, go to more and more and more expressive representations. And we had to go to more and more clever ways of doing inference, not just pick one inference engine. We now have in effect over a thousand inference engines um, that are all trying different ways to do uh, reasoning. So just to give you a simple example of what I mean so that we're all on the same page, uh, it, one of the early examples was Psych had to find images that matched certain queries only using the caption, not actually looking at the image at all, only looking at the captions of the images. So here there was some picture whose caption was Chris watched as his daughter take, took her first step. And Psych was able to match that to a query for men who are smiling and you know how does it do that well how would you do that well presumably if i asked you to introspect on it you'd say things like um, oh well uh, parents love their children when somebody you love does something um, big and uh, makes you happy um, taking one's first step is something big in their life and when you're happy you often smile and blah blah so uh, you'd introspect on these rules and these are exactly the kind of rules that we would encode in psych obviously all of these are default true. There are very few things that we'll talk about in, in a bit that are absolutely monotonically true. So how do we know that we've primed the pump in the way that I said? Well, here's a project we did for the Cleveland Clinic not that long ago, and I uh, was sort of answering doctors' uh, questions like this and so on. Um, and to create this application, we had to add um, a, a very small number of new assertions, about 120,000 rules to the tens of millions that Psych already knew. Um, and more importantly, when you actually look at Psych answering questions like this, um, most of, not just most of, but 95% of what gets used in answering the question are things that were put in before this application even started. The application started in 2007 and 95% of what Psych uses time after time after time in answering the questions are things that we put in years or decades before 2007. And why do we use an expressive logical representation um, rather than say what um, the rest of the world is using like knowledge graphs and so on? This is important and I'm gonna mention it like two or three times during this talk, but 
but it's basically because the different representations and the different logics have different powers. And so uh, if you think about Romeo and Juliet, when a human reads it, there are an awful lot of things that humans can answer um, about Romeo and Juliet. Um, like, um, you know, does Romeo believe that Juliet is dead after Balthazar reports that she is? And, you know, why does he believe that? And um, so on. Uh, so you can think of AI reading it and it's like, well, uh, there are three different levels in a way of AI applying to this problem. One would be some kind of text processing or machine learning. Um, and if you did something like that, you could actually answer all sorts of questions like um, um, who wore a mask in act two and um, so on. Um, and if the next level up would be using something like uh, what most of you use, which like knowledge graphs or triple stores or quad stores or um, owl ontologies or first order logic um, um, and so on. Um, um, and what separates those different logics um, is um, as we'll talk about different features they either do or don't support, how they deal with negation, how they deal with um, uh, defaults and exceptions and um, how they um, are with elaboration tolerance when you find out that something you thought was true isn't true um, and so on. Um, and a lot of the reasons there's all this divergence and a lot of the reason that people use as simple a representation as possible is just an efficiency reason. They use the simplest possible representation that works because the more complicated, the more expressive your representation, the slower your system is going to um, operate. And so there's this kind of trade-off curve uh, between how expressive your representation is and how efficient your system is gonna be as it does its reasoning and all the existing languages and representations lie on or below that, that curve. Unfortunately, what we want is something up here we want something which is expressive and efficient. Um, and in fact, I, I mentioned first order logic as though it were sufficient, but even first order logic is not expressive enough. And I don't just mean rarely, I mean commonly. I mean like 90 some percent of the time, if you look at conversations you've had, if you look at articles, if you look at say news reports, uh, this is a report from yesterday and so on, there's no way you could represent, let alone reason about all the things that humans would understand and be able to conclude from this um, short article without being able to understand all sorts of things about modality and temporal reasoning and defaults and contradictions and um, differences of opinion and uh, people saying things for uh, misinformation versus disinformation reasons and, um, and so on. So first order logic is really um, not expressive enough unless you fix your target like we did way back in the AM and Eurisco and um, automatic program synthesis days. If you don't fix your target, then you really need a more expressive logical representation. And that's okay because as I'll mention in a bit, we've found ways to speed up reasoning with more expressive representations basically by separating the epistemological problem of what should the system know from the heuristic problem of how can the system reason efficiently with what it knows. So as soon as you have these two languages and a way of translating between them, you can represent things in a nice, clean, logical, epistemological level language, and you can have some grubby heuristic level language um, that makes good use of special purpose representations and reasoning algorithms and does uh, some heuristic level reasoning very, very, very efficiently and almost never have to fall back on general theorem proving using the epistemological level representation. So this is really idea one of 150. I'm not gonna go through all 150, don't worry. But by now we have 1100 of these special purpose reasoners. Some are moderately general. Like if you have a transitive relation, you might as well cache the transitive closure of it so you can, when you get questions about it, you can answer them in one step instead of log in steps. So that's an example of a general one. Some specialized ones um, uh, include things like uh, balancing aqueous chemical um, equations and um, so forth. Um, idea two is making sure that you don't 
count on ignorance. You don't count on your knowledge base or your axiom base or your assertion base or rule base being small. That if things are running slowly, you speed things up by adding more knowledge, not by taking things away. Speed things up by adding meta-knowledge and meta-meta-knowledge um, until things are efficient enough. Uh, that's slightly tied to um, a third idea, which I'll talk about in a few minutes involving um, context and uh, micro theories. And um, I won't really talk too much um, about them. Let me actually switch and give you um, um, a quick um, demo of psych, just so that we're all on the same, the same page as far as what we mean by, by these things. So if we ask by can a can, um, can can, Psych will give you um, arguments that um, um, it can't because it's basically um, not alive, it doesn't have legs, it doesn't have a brain, and so on. If I ask, um, can an upside down coffee cup hold um, hot, hot coffee? Uh, psych will say um, uh, no, because the coffee will basically fall out because it's um, denser than air. But if I were to change this to um, something like um, um, helium gas and ask the question, then it would say yes, because helium gas, at least for a little while, it's lighter than air, so it'll stay in the coffee cup even when it's um, upside down and so on. Um, or if we ask, would a human uh, uh, dislike touching um, an incandescent light bulb when it's on? Um, it's like, well, presumably yes, uh, because uh, humans um, basically don't like feeling pain. And in this case, that touching event would cause pain because the light bulb is um, too hot to touch. And, um, and so on. Uh, by the way, all of these things are uh, the slowness here. It, you may think this is really fast, but almost all the time is being taken up by this natural language generation. Uh, the actual uh, psych L um, underneath it is, um, um, is basically um, what's actually running in about one tenth or one hundredth of the time that's involved. This is like the psych axiom that says that uh, uh, people. Uh, if you're touching something that is uh, super hot, that causes pain in um, whoever is um, um, touching it and so on. Um, and just to show you that we can handle some of the more sophisticated examples I talked about, um, if we ask about, uh, say, Romeo and Juliet, uh, we can ask uh, questions like, um, when the apothecary is selling lethal poison to Romeo, uh, what are his um, motives? for and against that. And well, the, the disincentive is uh, that at the time of uh, Romeo and Juliet um, in this fictional Mantua city, um, if you were caught selling lethal poison, you were put to death. So that's sort of a disincentive, but the incentive was that uh, the apothecary's um, family was um, uh, uh, very, very destitute and it was really important for him to keep his family alive and fed and so on. So that's what I mean by uh, doing this sort of conceptual reasoning and pro and con reasoning. Um, we can even look at some counterfactuals like um, how would Lord Montague have felt about the wedding of Romeo and Juliet if he had known about it? Uh, well, he would have felt um, a high level of um, um, abhorrence and so on. Um, and if we um, um, if we basically say, you know, why, um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Capulets and the Montagues were mutual enemies at the time um, that the uh, play took place. And if we reject that assertion and then ask the question again, now we would have felt vague positive approval because it was a union of two political houses in the same city and, um, and so on. So um, that's just to give you a quick, um, um, example of uh, of psych reasoning, just so you get a sense of um, the fact that we really can do a lot, and we can do a lot where the reasoning happens really, really quickly. So, um, as I said, uh, we actually set out to build the psych system, um, and building the psych system, we made lots of mistakes. So I'll just go through a bunch of the mistakes that we made. Uh, and hopefully uh, you'll avoid them. One was we focused on encyclopedic knowledge when in fact um, it turns out that um, um, as my discussion with um, Gordon Dixon and others you know, made clear, the encyclopedia is really almost the complement 
of common sense. If you look at, say, the Encyclopedia Britannica article on water, it's very long, it's several pages long. It, nowhere does it say that water makes things wet. And if you come in contact with water, you get wet. And then if something comes in contact with you, it's gonna get wet and so on. So it's almost like we don't wanna represent what's actually printed there, we, the, the black type on the page. We wanna represent the white space, the things that were not written down because the author presumed the reader already knew that it would be insulting or confusing to actually say that out loud. And so even by a year after we started the psych project, we realized that we wanted to focus on the complement of encyclopedic knowledge, not encyclopedic knowledge. So um, we ferried out common sense by looking at articles, by looking at blogs, by looking at novels, by looking at anything and saying, not what does it say, but what did the writer assume we already knew about the world? Um, and we can look at almost any um, ambiguity or polysemy or use of ellipsis. Um, um, for example, any pronouns, if I say Fred was mad at Joe because he stole his lunch, um, who's the he and the his? Presumably Fred was mad at Joe because Joe stole Fred's lunch. But if I change one word from because to so, now Fred was mad at Joe, so Fred stole Joe's lunch. And that has nothing to do with English grammar or anything. It has to do with your knowledge of what makes people mad and what they do when they're mad. And the fact that people often steal minor things, um, especially from communal refrigerators and so on. Um, the other place we often look is the gap between one sentence and the next one. So in between these two sentences, you assume that uh, Fred uh, was caught, he was arrested, he had a trial, he was found guilty. Uh, and so on. If the next sentence says the judge, you expect that it has to do with the judge at the trial, which had not been mentioned up until now, and so on. We also look at um, articles from the um, 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 National Enquirer, from the Weekly World News, and so on, and say, what do we know about the world that causes us not to believe uh, what it's telling us about the world um, as, as being true? Um, well, so uh, another mistake we made, and this is one that some of you may make, is agonizing too much over the upper ontology, trying to get that right. If you look at a lot of the ontologies out there, a lot of them are fairly small because people have agonized over getting the, the upper level right. I think part of that has to do with kind of deification of Aristotle. Aristotle got a lot right, but he also got a lot wrong. And a lot of what he said about ontology was wrong and his focus on um, uh, symmetry and, um, and so on. Um, I have a feeling John Soa and I could argue for hours about this, but hopefully uh, we won't take up any of your time um, arguing about it um, during uh, the Q&A session, but I'd be happy to argue later with you, John, about that. Um, but the thing that's most important here is that it doesn't matter that much what your upper ontology is, the impact is gonna be more efficiency than anything else. Um, the fifth generation, um, EDR project uh, trying to do what Psych did um, and their ontology at the very, very, very top. The first distinction they made was between things that had souls and things that didn't have souls. And big trees had souls and small trees didn't. So some trees were on one side of their um, great divide and so the other trees and bushes were on the other side and so on. But still, we have no trouble understanding people who view the world that way. It just affects um, efficiency because some of the things like um, having um, um, roots and being um, plant cells and so on, um, you just have to say it twice, once on one side and once on the other. So it affects efficiency. And not just the upper ontology, things like, um, do we wanna create the government of France in 2009 as a single term? No, we wanna factor that so we can compositionally express things like that by building terms out of um, other terms using term building functions. And to take the ultimate extreme of bad ontologizing, suppose you don't have words for blue and green, you instead have these horrible terms, grew and clean, grew are things that are green by day and blue by night, clean are things that are blue by day and green at night. These are horrible because there's nothing in the real world which is grew and nothing which is green. but you can still say, grass is green, you just have to say it longer, more um, verbosely. You have to say something like grasses grew by day and bleen by night. Um, 
and so on. The extreme of that is like smurfing, where they use the word smurf to mean pretty much anything. And they expect the person watching the smurf cartoon to understand that because they already have common sense. Uh, so one of the first mistakes we made was we had this physical containment relation in, X is in Y um, physically, uh, but then it turns out that there are all sorts of questions you can't really um, answer correctly. Like if I look in there, can I see it? Can I see it from the outside? If I turn it over, will it fall out? And so on, because the way that air is in this room is different from the way this dollar is in my pocket, which is different from the way the sugar is in my coffee um, and so on. And so um, eventually we had to tease that apart into something like 75 different kinds of in relations and each predicate, each relation is a first class object in our system. So that was just an ontologizing of the in relationship. The same thing is true of other general relations like with and so on. So um, the reason why you don't want to um, have this inefficiency is it makes it longer and more error prone for people to manually write uh, longer sentences than short ones, longer axioms than short ones. Um, if the axioms are much, much longer, they have um, lots more um, terms and clauses, so it makes the inference engine slow down. Um, and also, um, you have to make sure that you've put in all the cross ontology mapping axioms um, and so on. So you don't really wanna have lots and lots of different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, so do we really wanna be able to say the sun is yellow because it's a yellow object and it has yellowness and its color is the yellow color. Um, and by the way, it satisfies this unary predicate. And we can talk about um, the frequency and wavelengths of the light that come off of the uh, solar spectrum and so on. So the more you have multiple ways of representing things, sometimes it's cost effective, but you have to be careful because you also need to interrelate these by writing the interstitial axioms that connect them. So a good example of something right around the borderline is white and black has, do you really wanna have these well, there are lots of things like superstitions and so on to say about black cats, not so much to say about white cats. Um, so I've already talked a little bit about uh, this trade-off where we want to, kicking and screaming, move to this higher order logic representation rather than using um, triple stores or quad stores as our representation. That also makes, by the way, natural language um, a lot better impedance match where I can now have a a natural language way to express between the long and generate a nice English sentence very quickly, which is how those explanation sentences um, got generated. So we basically want to be able to um, have nested quantifiers because order matters in quantifiers, not so much in English. Uh, you want to be able to distinguish things like is a from um, subset of, element of, from subset of, and so on, because element of is not transitive. You want to be able to have predicates be first class objects in your system to ask questions like how are Jill and Joe Biden related? You need to be able at some point in order to do different applications, you need to be able to represent uh, the work you've done so far and what Psych is thinking about and what it's tried in order to represent tactics and strategies and, um, and so on, uh, modals and nested modals and um, so on as we saw uh, in a lot of these cases. Um, so, um, the, the problem is um, also that uh, this led to interfaces involving node link graphs, which are really sweet, uh, but um, didn't represent higher order logic assertions very well. We switched to um, various other um, um, different representations and editors and interfaces. I won't go through that now because um, I want to get on to the Q&A session in a little while, um, but um, we do have this critical mistake of taking the word representation singular too seriously. And as I mentioned, we really want to not play that game by having multiple representations. So we're not going to allow ourselves to make that trade-off choice. We're going to have multiple representations and something that maps between them. And the philosophers, the logicians, um, the Eloy can write on um, things in this beautiful expressive logic and then the programmers, the Morlocks, uh, the inference programmer specialists can figure out how to devise special purpose representations and algorithms to make those things um, happen um, efficiently. Um, another mistake we made was there was a proliferation of inference um, parameters um, and uh, 
Inference parameters are things like maximum time limit, maximum number of back chain steps allowed, and, um, and so on. Uh, eventually, we had 150 inference parameters, which was nuts. Um, and then we did some study, and we said, oh, in the last million times psych has been called, six different combinations of parameters essentially are all we ever would have needed. And so instead of having some um, astronomical number of uh, like two to the 150th settings, we now have six. So that makes things a lot simpler. Um, and at one point we realized that whenever the general theorem prover got called on, it took too long and we eventually gave up anyway. And so very, very quietly, we turned off the general theorem prover around 2010 and nobody ever noticed. Uh, so yes, I know some of you are going to be offended by that, but too bad, pragmatically, um, turned out to just speed things up a lot. Yeah. Um, um, another mistake we made, um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and finish up soon, Bobby, don't worry, um, no was um, that uh, we made the mistake of thinking that if we released the skeleton of psych, what we called open psych, the ontology of terms and their taxonomic relations, that people would see that that's not really what they wanted. They needed the other 90% of psych and they would come to us and work with us. And essentially um, almost nobody did. And that was sort of too bad. Um, so you don't just want to represent things like person and sleep in bed at night. You want to represent things like people sleep in beds if they can. They sleep lying down. They sleep for hours at a time. Uh, they can be woken up. They don't like being woken up and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, that's, where, that's where we are. We couldn't have a correct ontology. We had to give up the notion that there is a correct ontology because especially if you think about different applications, one thing is true ontologically in one application and um, worse than useful um, in another application. So essentially you want to contextualize, represent explicitly the context in which it's worth acting as though some assertion is true. So for every assertion we indicate uh, what context it's true. And yes, there's a little bit of math, which is true universally, but almost nothing is true everywhere. Uh, so we had to, to give up global consistency, which is a very hard thing to do, uh, but we instead moved to local consistency, much like you know the surface of the earth is um, spherical, but you act in your everyday life for efficiency reasons as though it were flat. And it works because it's a two manifold. It is locally flat. In much the same way, Sykes' knowledge base is inconsistent, but it's divided up into a vast number of territories which are more or less consistent, which are the contexts or micro theories that we have. Um, and we have different dimensions of micro theories. Um, things are true at one time and false at another. Things are true in one culture or one person's belief system and false at another. Um, things are true at one level of granularity and false at another, um, and so on. Um, I won't go through um, all the factoring of context for um, our reasons of speed, but uh, this is being recorded, so you can go back and catch that slide if you, um, if you want to. Um, I've already mentioned things like argumentation and the fact that we had to deal with uh, defaults. Uh, this turned out to be very important um, for reasons that um, come up all the time in, um, in Sykes applications. And then another mistake was taking everything I just said too seriously. Don't want to take everything I just said too seriously, because in a lot of cases, you happen to know that only the following small set of assertions is going to be used in solving this problem. Uh, like if you're doing a Sudoku um, problem, um, you know that there's a sm you know there are 12 things you need to know, and new knowledge is not going to come in while you're solving in the middle of solving that problem. And you don't really need anything other than SAT constraints to solve Sudoku problems and so on. Um, and you can be consistent when solving and so on. So basically in many cases, take everything that I said with a grain of salt. Uh, there are also lots of pitfalls that um, are small mistakes we made all the time, like taking um, names too seriously, um, taking the names of terms too seriously. It's the concepts behind them that matter. And so really what you wanna do is separate knowledge of words in a natural language like English, like the English word Coke from the different denotations like Coca-Cola and so on and cocaine. Um, so that the knowledge that let's say um, a, um, um, a, a, a 
penitentiary is larger than a corral is something that has nothing to do with the fact that in English you might use the word pen, P-E-N, to represent both of them. Sometimes people would overgeneralize, sometimes they would overspecialize, um, and so there are all sorts of pitfalls, which were other mistakes that we made. Um, so the last thing I want to focus on is, as I mentioned, the way to connect the right brain and the left brain, the uh, machine learning type and the ontologically based, knowledge based types of AI together. Uh, one way to connect them is to have um, explicitly worked out APIs. So every time this machine learning system recognizes a cat, um, it sends a message to this knowledge-based system saying picture blah, blah, blah contains a um, you know, hash dollar CAT in it and so on. Um, a second way of connecting the two um, is to say, well, the knowledge-based system can basically generate training data for the machine learning systems. And that's what we've been doing uh, for a couple of years in the DARPA uh, Machine Common Sense MCS program. Um, and a third way, and really the most powerful way, is to treat this as a kind of back and forth synergy, where say the machine learning system generates hypotheses and the knowledge base system sits back and metaphorically puffs on its pipe and thinks about those. So in a project we did for the National Library of Medicine, one of the NIH institutes, um, we looked at um, GWASs, the cost of sequencing a human person's uh, DNA has gone from infinity to billions of dollars to hundred dollars. So now large hospitals routinely will sequence a patient's DNA and build up a database of mutations, single nucleotide polymorphisms and the phenotypic conditions, the diseases that those genotypic mutations actually correlate with. Um, and doctors were very excited when these started to emerge, these glosses, because um, now you can look for these A to Z correlations between a mutation and a disease. And sometimes that works really well and makes the news very often. In fact, most of the time, those lead doctors, lead researchers on wild goose chases for various reasons. There's some third cause going on or um, the correlation was noisy or something, the data was noisy. Anyway, this is where something like Psych comes in. Psych uses public knowledge about what reactions occur, where, where in the body with what inputs and outputs, what catalyzes what, what polymerizes what. We can look those things up on um, um, public knowledge sources. Um, and then Psych puts together a causal chain, a pathway 10, 20 steps long that says, oh yeah, this mutation um, would be next to this gene, which if it got expressed would be this protein, which if it got to this part of the body, um, would catalyze this reaction, by the way, making more bioactive vitamin D in your blood, blah, blah, blah. 10 steps later, uh, screws up um, the bone mineralization. Uh, and that's why you got osteoporosis early in life. And so you shouldn't believe that A to Z correlation. You shouldn't really even believe this Rube Goldberg like 20 step chain. But if you can't even find one 20 step chain, you should be very skeptical of the A to Z correlation. But more importantly, if in the middle of that chain, there are testable predictions, you can go back to the data. In some cases, the data was collected decades ago and say, by the way, did those patients who had this mutation and who had osteoporosis, did they actually have higher levels of bioactive vitamin D in their blood? And that's very good evidence to confirm or disconfirm that you got the right um, causal explanation. So I see that as the real synergy between the correlation and causation types of reasoning that right brain and left brain um, reasoning do. And I see that as really the future of how we should be working with the rest of um, AI um, today. So I won't go through the, the rest of this. Um, I don't really have um, time to talk about mistakes going forward, but um, these are the, um, the things we're focusing on going forward. A lot of it has to do with now putting our money where our mouth is and working on real full natural language understanding um, using knowledge rather than using um, statistical parsers and, and, uh, and things like that. And we're focusing on improving our tools for people to lower the bar so that more people can more easily use psych, making it easier for people to put in knowledge and edit knowledge. I'll just give you one quick example, which is an abducer. 
So you're building an application using psych. Um, it runs on an example, it gets the wrong answer. Um, the expert looks at it and says, oh, you got the wrong answer. This is the right answer. So instead of making someone figure out what's wrong, psych at that point uses everything it knows about common sense knowledge, general knowledge, domain knowledge, context, and so on to say, here are five or 10 things which are all plausible. And if any one of these were true, I would have gotten the answer that you just told me I should have gotten. And often the expert can go look through that and say, oh yeah, number seven, that's actually something I forgot to tell you. And so now without understanding anything about logic or AI or programming, you have a tool which helps domain experts to edit and correct and improve um, the knowledge base. So let me stop at this point. We have about half an hour for um, questions um, and I'd be happy to, um, to entertain some. Thank you. So great talk, very, very great talk. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, so I've collected uh, the I, questions. Yes. The first question was from Doug Miles. Yes. Doug, you had a question about explainable AI. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say, ask if explainable AI type uh, interest has been excited about psych the way they should be. Because there's been a lot of explainable AI interest out there. How's that been going? Uh, no, there's been almost no um, um, interest or interaction. Um, in fact, if I were to unfairly um, characterize uh, what's going on, and you know, since I'm a nice guy, I would never normally do that. Um, uh, that was like a joke. Um, I would say that uh, there's a tendency, um, if you're not careful, to double down on the pure machine learning approach and to basically say, uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, well, okay, let, let, me, let me be slightly fair. There's a kind of um, honest way of doing it. Um, and what some kids, so the honest way of doing it is to say, well, all we can really tell you is this is the sensitivity in the data. These are the pixels that caused us to say, this was a tank on the, um, on the border with Ukraine versus uh, this is a, um, a pickup truck uh, loaded with um, hay or something. And if you look at these pixels and you disagree, um, then you should doubt our um, conclusion or something. So that's the fair way to do it. The, um, the dangerous way, the thing that scares the hell out of me is that you can do it a different way. You can basically say, we're gonna double down on machine learning. We're going to have an enormous amount of training data of which explanations were convincing and compelling to which individuals. And so now if we have enough training data, we know that in order to get you to believe our answer to the question you just asked, this is the argument I should give you. Not because it has anything to do with how I got the answer, not because it has anything to do with what is the right answer, but because statistically, I know this will satisfy you and make you trust the answer. This is very scary. This is like advertising. This is like Wall Street. And we should not be doing that. We should be doing the kind of synergy that I was um, getting at. Um, and I'm very scared that um, this sort of doubling down on machine learning will cause systems which are very brittle to become trusted and cause accidents which will then inflame the public, the media, the government to have some kind of reaction against AI, which wouldn't be um, deserved um, and wouldn't be necessary if we just essentially worked together. But uh, the, in real life, you are seeing this happening, Doug. People are intruding uh, and are targeting and are using weaknesses or uh, like abilities of people to drag them into situations. So states are beginning to do that as, so, as long as individuals uh, you can control. But yes, you make very good point. Thank you. Next, uh, I, Next I, Bob, want, Bob, I want uh, Bob, I want, oh. Robin was the next to ask a question. Sure, sure. Um, it, it, hi, Doug. It looks like the answer, or at least the best answer, was Holonic, and you move your perspective or context around until you get the best fit. Is that what you're doing? And 
are you moving to contextual nesting like Lisp? Yeah, so I, I would say think of this as um, at least um, in theory, all happening in parallel so that you're answering questions, at least in theory, um, in all contexts. And in most contexts, um, the, um, the answers are, um, I don't know because it's you know, after my time or um, it's not my field of study or something. Um, and in some contexts, it's like, um, yes, and here's the answer, um, but different um, experts, different groups, different um, time periods and so on will come up with lots of different answers. And now the question is um, where you're specifying um, not just the context when you're putting knowledge in, but you're specifying the context when you ask your question. So here's the context in which I'm asking my question. Um, those of you old enough to remember um, the Rocky and Bullwinkle show will remember Mr. Peabody's Wayback Machine, which had all sorts of gears and levers and dials and so on. And you'd set all those and then you'd push a button. So in some ways, that's what's going on here, where you can say, um, from the point of view of a diehard, let's say, um, uh, conservative uh, Republican uh, fundamentalist in uh, 2022 answer this question. Um, for a conservative Republican in 1980 answered this question. For what the average um, uh, liberal Democrat today thinks the average Republican would say if you were to ask them this question, answer it from that context. So you're setting all these little dials and parameters as it were that specify the context in which you're asking the question. And then by having all the knowledge explicit and contextualized, like I mentioned, you're able to actually answer the question. OK. Well, I have a, a question here. Uh, Can I... uh, John, wait for a second. Um, there was a question on the Zoom chat, which looks interesting. Uh, but I think the person who asked it isn't here anymore. Can you share your thoughts on Judea Pearl idea of causal I think it's a causal or casual inference and the latter of causation. So it must be causal inference. Yeah, so um, I, um, I like Jude a lot. Um, he and I um, um, have worked together um, in the, um, well, in the waning decades of the Soviet Union, we made trips to, uh, uh, to Russia to uh, take, take things to uh, Jewish refuseniks and things like that. Um, so. Um, I have a lot of respect for him um, as, a, um, as a human being and as a scientist. Um, um, I, dis I disagree with um, um, his, his what, what, it's true that mathematically what he's saying is correct and consistent, um, but I believe it does not fully capture the notion of what we mean by context. And I believe that by, um, by using words like causation and context, the way that he uses them, um, he's actually slightly confusing the issue, although it's probably fair for him to say that most people um, um, use his terminology and I'm confusing the issue. <laughs> okay, John. Yeah, uh, I like the, uh, and, uh, the approach you're taking very much. I'll qualify a number of things, but I really uh, think that the importance of context is enormous. One of the points that I'd also mention is uh, I don't believe that neural networks represent more than a tiny part of machine learning. And to identify ML with neural networks is hopelessly, hopelessly confusing. The only thing that uh, the neural networks do is to compute a function from, uh, they get, give it, given a set of X, Y pairs, they compute a function from X to Y. That's all they do and nothing more. And that's important, but you can't use that ex unless you really uh, consider the context and a huge amount of related information. And uh, as for uh, applications of, uh, um, machine learning systems, the major part of every one of those applications is symbolic. If you take something like uh, uh, the uh, uh, chess, pro chess playing programs from uh, the checker or the checker programs uh, from uh, the 1950s, they, they have two major parts. The symbolic 
part, which is uh, if I do this, then he does that, and I do this, and he does that. And then the learning part, where you evaluate a function, where you evaluate the value of a particular ch uh, checker position, chess position, or go position. These are two very important points. The, eval the machine learning part without the symbolic part is hopelessly useless. So if you take the uh, Go program that uh, beat the world champion, the only part that machine learning did was to evaluate a given position and determine uh, what's the likely uh, uh, value as far as winning or losing. And everything else in the program is purely symbolic, but that uh, importance of determining the uh, relative value of winning or losing is what was learned by uh, a function. And that function is so good that it enabled the, the uh, AlphaGo to beat the world champion. But the point is the machine learning part, was the, or the neural network part was just a tiny, tiny part of the whole program, but its value was enormous. And that's a simple, uh, the point that I'd make about all of these machine learning systems, the part that is learned by the neural networks is just a function. And uh, Andrew Ng, who is uh, one of the people who was uh, one of the pioneers in these deep learning methods, made that point that the only thing that is learned is what uh, people, uh, what the uh, machine learning, the, the things that the, the ML systems do is what humans can do in one second. They learn how to recognize some sort of a pattern, and in one second, they reach some sort of conclusion. And that is all that they do. They don't do the rest of the reasoning. So I say that, uh, you know, that's important, a very- Yeah, so, so yeah. Let, let, let me stop you, because I, I agree 100% with everything you just said. Um, our, in fact, I gave a talk uh, a little while ago um, um, on a, a DARPA um, program coming up called Centaurs. It's called a centaur, because it's not like half human, half horse. It's because it's like, half symbolic um, and half um, machine learning and so on. Uh, and um, uh, the statistical learning. Uh, and in fact, the AlphaGo people were there and gave a talk and I used Arthur Samuel's um, uh, checker playing program from uh, the late fifties as a uh, really one of the rare examples, especially at the time, but one of the uh, sort of disappointingly rare examples I mean, since then where people really did understand and explicitly represent and balance Symbolic reasoning and um, uh, statistical and uh, uh, statistical learning. So I, I agree completely with what you said. Um, there's a, um, a recent article I read by um, Ashok Goel. I think it was in um, AI Magazine. I may be uh, misremembering, uh, where he talks about the, um, the the kind of issues that you were just raising, John. And he actually goes into a very nice analysis of uh, the uh, the sort of relationships and what the relationship could be. Okay, one of the, I, okay, I'm glad we agree very much. Uh, one point that I also would change is to take the word ML and do not identify with neural networks. Artificial neural networks are extremely important, but all they learn is monadic functions. They are, learn a monadic predicate or function. And what you need are dyadic relations and triadic relations. Triadic relations always include some mental component like purpose or goal or value. And uh, they're hopelessly, they cannot, it uh, they never are able to learn dyadic or uh, triadic relations because they're always dependent on the context. So I would recommend that instead of using the word ML, you should use the word NN or DNN or artificial neural networks, because it's important to say that, uh, to tell people that neural networks are a tiny, tiny part of machine learning and machine learning has to include dyadic relations, triadic relations and context, but above all, context is enormous. And that, by the way, when you talk about ontology, I uh, emphasize the major problem with this uh, ISO standard for ontology is that it completely ignores context and any kind of a context, the, the advantage of a micro theory is that it is always designed for a particular context. And so the great success of uh, ontology is when 
than micro theories. What they do are invent the micro theories. And when you look at uh, these various applications to uh, say uh, software development, they're always software development for a particular context. And that what they develop is a very nice micro theory, but they do not uh, develop a general purpose ontology. And it's the point I would make is that uh, that uh, ISO standard for ontology is hopelessly, hopelessly wrong because they don't recognize the importance of micro theories. Yeah, so I, I again, um, I, to repeat myself, I, I agree with what you just said. Um, I, I think that there may be, um, th there may be more people out there doing um, uh, sort of a mach machine learning projects that would um, um, horrify and disappoint you because they are not much more than a neural net um, type learning um, and so on. But um, it's certainly true that some of what goes on under the label of machine learning is much, much more than just um, the, uh, the NN and uh, DNN stuff that, um, that I was referring to. You're right. And I'll, I'll try and be a little bit more precise going forward. Okay, great. It's important to emphasize that point because the world has been brainwashed to think that neural networks equal machine learning, and that is hopelessly false. Right. I, I, I don't want to okay. do that. Can I interject <laughs> at this time and suggest that we have a, another one hour session in which we would generally have discussions along this line between Doug and John and others who are interested. So we can have more uh, substantial time devoted to some of the important questions that John has asked. Ron Ross has also a question. Of course, I hand over back to Ken. Well, the next question was from Steve Ray. Okay. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Um, basically, I think I just, it's sort of consistent with what you were just talking about which is I think people equate uh, or apply machine learning to perception problems. And uh, the symbolic ones are appropriate for cognition problems. And that's kind of the way I separate and explain to people where neural nets work is the perception, it's just correlation. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think that that's not a bad, that's not a bad way to, um, to think about dividing it up. I like that. Okay. That's it. So now, Ravi, you had some questions. You're muted. Wait, you said you said Ron had a question. Ravi, he's muted himself, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, Ron. Uh, I would request Ron to ask his question, and then I will ask. OK. I we sort of uh, missed the end of uh, Doug's uh, presentation, which was future mistakes yet to be made, which I was sort of really looking forward to because that seems to be the most useful in some ways part of it. Anyway, could you just briefly summarize any that you didn't mention? One, one type of mistake is if we're not careful because we are supporting ourselves commercially, um, not through um, government grants anymore, not through, um, 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 other types of funding. Uh, there is this pressure all the time to um, cut corners and build things that are more like um, old stovepipe um, expert system applications. And we have to constantly fight to do things that um, are as general as the rest of site and not put in effort and content um, just because uh, we need it for a particular application. So there's that kind of mistake that we're constantly fighting against. A different type of mistake is one where we're um, either being too restrictive or not restrictive enough on access to psych. So I'd love for researchers to make use of all of psych, get a version of psych that's out there for people to, um, to work on, um, have some license like our research like application license that basically says you can use all of psych for research purposes for free and so on. Uh, so the, the potential mistake is um, either being too restrictive in, in that or not restrictive enough where the technology escapes and gets you know, put out on the web and, and things like that. And I could see um, one way or another in hindsight, we might be going 
uh, too far in one direction or another. Uh, so I'm, I'm worried about that. Another mistake is uh, that we could be making is the degree to which we should be focusing on natural language understanding. We're putting an enormous fraction of our, uh, what you might think of as IR&D, internal R&D resources on uh, natural language um, processing, natural language understanding, and so on. So that's a bet that we're making. That bet might or might not turn out to, um, to pay off. Um, I know Microsoft did that um, for about 25 years and um, uh, got very little out of it. And eventually the people working on that retired and went away and um, that symbolic uh, natural language project sort of uh, faded away and died. Uh, so I'm very um, nervous about that. I still think it's the right thing to do, but um, it's certainly on the list of possible possible mistakes you might hear about in uh, in years to come. So those those are a few of the mistakes that uh, that we might be that we might be making. And with your permission, I just say that this is a good point for me to make. And uh, what I wrote in chat that if you if you would not mind somehow publicizing or putting on your website somewhere, these lists of mistakes, it would help ontologists of the future to learn and not do the roundabout way of finding out the shortcuts that are valuable and then be focused on their objective, not make the mistakes. I request you. That's a good idea. And in fact, Gary Marcus and I are in the middle of writing an article um, specifically about this. And so um, I'll make sure that that gets very prominent coverage and knowing Gary, he'll make sure it gets very, very prominent coverage uh, once we um, finish that, uh, which basically will focus a lot on the, um, the, the synergies, but also the mistakes that were made and, um, and so on. So that's, that's the focus of that. And also, there is one uh, question from my colleague, Gary Burkross, I don't know. Uh, can you talk, Gary? Yeah. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes. Hello, Doug. Uh, Gary, good to hear from you. Good to see you again. It's been a long time. Um, the theme of the summit this year is about disasters such as the COVID and health, uh, climate change, and so forth. I'm wondering if you could say a few words about uh, what sure. Psych has to offer there, and particularly maybe uh, a research site might be available for some people uh, in this area. Our... Um, uh, one of our largest applications is in healthcare, specifically um, for hospitals, um, dealing with staffing issues, dealing with matriculation through the hospital of a patient, uh, and so on. And uh, one of the, the things that was driven home by COVID was the need to be able to take these systems, uh, which could be psych-based or could be just large you know, Java programs or, or something like that. Um, and um, to, to, basically, uh, to, to basically say we have to modify these because now parking lot A is a morgue, operating room B is now a five person room, uh, five person uh, patient uh, room. Um, and uh, this machine, which used to um, have a throughput of seven minutes uh, to do a, um, an MRI, now has a, a throughput of 15 minutes because it has to be uh, sanitized in between every use where it wasn't in ways that it wasn't before and so on. And so being able to take um, a knowledge-based application like we had and make those changes is like in some sense almost as quick as what I just said, where you find the things and say, oh, in the context of um, the following kind of pandemic or the following specific pandemic, um, the following changes are made and now you do reasoning differently and the answers you come up with are differently versus somehow you had this million line Java program and now you have to figure out how to modify it um, in the face of COVID and so on. So that was very compelling to be able to show that a knowledge-based solution um, afforded things like that in a way that's also what lets you do hypothetical what if reasoning and say, what if um, the following um, um, operating rooms were unavailable. What if the following machines um, were broken or inaccessible? What if the following um, test turned out to be um, unavailable and so on? So um, there's a lot of uh, very um, exciting um, things that are happening because of the fact that you can take 
um, a knowledge-based representation, a declarative representation, and effectively edit it in ways that uh, you can't nearly as easily um, edit procedural code. So that's, um, so that's sort of um, a, a big impact um, and a big way of demonstrating the value of the kind of AI that all of us are working on and all of you are working on. Ram had a really good question. I just saw it in chat, maybe he wants to ask it. Ram and Janet have questions. Uh, yeah, this is Ram here, Doug. That, that was an excellent talk. And let me see, I have a, a couple of quick questions. One is that there's this whole effort on knowledge, open knowledge networks going on and NSF has, uh, I guess, putting in considerable amount of uh, funding into that. Now, is there a relationship between Psych and o OK, OKN? No, and, no. Uh, the second question, which I also want to ask is, you mentioned healthcare. And in the healthcare, uh, Watson, IBM Watson, which also has some kind of ontology built in there, uh, had some several problems. Uh, uh, you probably must have uh, heard about uh, what happened to them in the recent past. So can you comment on that and see how we can avoid those kinds of things in the future in healthcare? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not as familiar with the details of what happened with Watson, but my, um, my impression of it, I'd be happy to hear um, other people who are more familiar with it. Um, explain um, explain what, what they think really happened. But I think a lot of it turned out to be uh, something where there was um, overhyping by the marketing people. And then the technology, even though it was valuable, uh, wasn't able to do the things that um, essentially were being promised for it. Um, and that people became um, disillusioned and had a negative reaction. And, um, you know, We've seen that before with AI winters. We've seen that before with the um, uh, the, the the hype cycle, um, and so on. Um, and I think that um, if we're not careful, those kinds of things will continue to happen. And so that's that's one of the reasons that I think we need to work together more um, to to give more realistic expectations, set more realistic expectations. Um, you can see that that about to happen in self-driving cars. You can see that uh, about to happen in lots of places, not just, um, not just healthcare, I think. But I'd be interested if, if someone is more familiar with the Watson case um, and can, can give a different characterization of what the problem was. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Doug. On the, on the OKN uh, initiative, have you, uh, do you know of that? Or uh, I guess people must have approached you. No, absolutely no, no contact, no approach. Um, oh, no, no one seems interested in talking with us about it. Um, I'd be happy to talk with them about it. Oh, I'm surprised. Okay, well, yeah, I think we should follow up on that because uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, which I think from site people, you know, okay, and also can learn. And Janet? maybe there are some things which they have done that which might be of uh, uh, interest to you. Thank you, Tom. Janet? Um, yes, uh, Pierre Chaminad had a good question about the synergy. Um, uh, and you know, sort of being uh, difficult to standardize for those of us who didn't start working on it 40 years ago, um, uh, or you know, all the companies that didn't start working on it 40 years ago. I, I'm summarizing briefly there, but I I was going to urge if you are available, um, can we continue this because I think there's lots of um, yes, yeah, including, including that question. Um, um, are you available? Doug Miles was saying that there were a few openings uh, for sessions. Sure. Um, in, you know, in, in, Two weeks from now, there is. Yeah, we, we just need to, we need to schedule something and um, you know, I'd, be, I'd, be happy to, I'd be happy to come back and talk some more. I, I gave a, um, um, a, a preliminary version of this, as I mentioned, um, at the very, very first um, on the log forum uh, meeting. And so I figure um, I should come back every 20 years and, and do this, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to come back more frequently. You have to come more frequent. Yes, I'm happy to do that more possibly, frequently. Possible yeah, with a one on one, a lot of discussion <laughs> with John as well as with others who have participated. Right, and hopefully. Right. And I'm, one thing I'd like to talk to you about is um, we're starting to think about next year's summit topic. And I'd like to, one of the ideas was to revisit the original um, two sessions and maybe see what can be, um, you know, from the perspective of 20 years on, um, 
what's been learned, what could be uh, done differently and summarized what was not possible to finish then. But um, I don't know, is there more time now or should we wrap this up? Because Pierre had a good question. Well, we, I think we need to wrap it up. Uh, we're actually already running over. Uh, okay. Uh, so why don't we, why don't we adjourn now and start again? Yeah. Um, I believe it's in two weeks. Is that right? Cool. Next week is a synthesis or what? At the synthesis session. Oh, ninth, ninth February, somebody has agreed. No, it's synthesis. And then 16th, someone has agreed. Gary, you are going to let us know if that person is going to speak on 16th or not. We can do this offline. Well, yeah, it'll be two or three weeks from now. Uh, we have to we have to do that offline and do the scheduling. Is that okay with you, Doug? Um, I, I think so. I have to check my calendar, but I, I definitely would like to uh, come back in the time frame of weeks, not uh, decades. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. Tell us. Tell us your uh, constraints, and uh, I'm sure we can work around them. And John. Thank you for inviting me. This is a great session and great, great questions, everybody. And I would okay. like John, John's convenience as well, because he will bring a lot of overviews. I have one quick one. I guess I will wait. I was wondering what happens behind a search engine and what happens behind Sy in Psyc. What are the comparisons and what are the differences? But that we can reserve for yeah, next. That's a that would take a long time. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Um, so thanks to everyone. Thanks to uh, uh, especially to Doug, and uh, we will continue this session in a uh, probably in a couple of weeks. Great. Thanks a lot, Doug. Very kind of you to get us started on psych again. We yes, have wonderful. Much Just wonderful. So, Bye now. So long, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.